chapter 4. I, I have to be honest, probably my least favorite chapter. But it is important, or else we wouldn't do it. It's just, you know, we, remember at the beginning of the semester, we talked about hardware and software and the basics of computing. This is chapter four in Cybertext because it is really part of the discussion of the basics of, 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 of computing. Um, but I felt we could move it back. Nothing else relies on it. And so we could get some other more important things or things that you know, really we build upon, get those done first. But now it's time, chapter four. We'll talk about the components of telecommunications networks. Talk about local area and wide area networks. Talk about the internet, intranets, and extranets. Talk about something called a client-server architecture, client-server systems, which is the way that most computer systems are built today. We'll talk, then we'll talk about how communication is done between companies in the real world today. E-business, XML, and XBRL. How many of you have heard of XBRL somewhere? Yes. It's in accounting. It's the way that financial statements, financial information is transmitted. Okay? And those are, and e, they, those are specific forms of EDI. So telecommunications networks have five components. There's some kind of local device, your laptop, your phone, whatever it might be. There's some means of linking it wirelessly or... Um, we'll talk about a few of those. There are transmission methods, protocols. Uh, we'll talk about what nodes and switches are. And then we'll talk about architecture and standards. So local devices. I'm not going to get into it. There are too many of them. Terminals, workstations, you know, your, your toaster oven, whatever it might be, is a local device. Your transmission links. So there are three wired forms of linking. Twisted pair, which is really your, the old-fashioned telephone wire that you'd have in a home. It's called twisted pair. It's two cables that are twisted with wire on the inside. Then there's coaxial cable which is used by your cable TV company. And I think you all know what that looks like. It's got the copper wire around, with insulation around it, etc. It has a broader band than twister pa twisted pair. And then there's the newest model for ground linking, which is fiber optics. Verizon's famous for it, which um, allows for a significantly higher transmission rate and volume than either of the others. So those are the three physical transmission media or wires, but of course, there's also wireless transmission. And it comes in two forms. It could be through microwaves or through radio frequency waves or RF waves. What does this look like to anybody here? Well, what kind of devices use this? Phone towers, your cell phone. That's how cell phones communicate. They just relay your signal all the way across. Now, what they also do is sometimes some of these relay stations are wired, so then your, your, phone, your, your wireless call is actually going through wires to get it longer distances quicker. Um, but this is in line with what you'd expect your cell phone communication. That's why you see towers every 10 miles or whatever they are. And they need line of sight so that they could communicate with each other. And then you have the televisions, which are aiming up to a satellite that's high in the sky. You need line of sight th to that as well, but um, it's a bit easier to, to do that. Of course, it's up in the sky. Then there are two transmission methods, the old style and the new style. Analog, 
Remember um, trigonometry, sine waves, sine curves? No? Sokotoa? Nothing. I'm a lot older than you. I remember Sokotoa. Well, anyway, analog it, sound is a wave. And these waves are um, transmitted along the wire. And they get to the other end. And digital is what we know. Zeros and ones are transmitted, and they're converted um, into the final, you know, the final sound at, at the destination. Analog transmission is related to circuit switching. So you ever see any of those old movies where Gladys was standing there going like this, you know, plugging people in, to operator, you know, all done by hand? That was a manual circuit switching, creating a circuit. And then Gladys was replaced by a computer that did the circuit switch for you. But essentially the same idea, where you took it and it just automatically connected you to your destination. Digital transmissions have something called packet switching. So all the data and all the voice and everything you, you communicate with today and frankly, your phone calls, too, because they are digitized now, are transmitted via packet switching. Your zeros and ones are put together into packets, packages, and those packages are shipped across the communications line. It's not good. Obviously, you could be on the phone for an hour. It's not going to wait until you're done talking. It takes a logical amount, packages it, and goes. A logical amount, packages it, and goes. And then it's all recombined at the end. We'll talk about that in a, in a minute. So that's um, packet switching, which is the model used in today's digital world. So in circuit switching, the path is fixed. In packet switching, each packet is sent separately and frankly can go through a different pathway. And each one will find its best pathway to the destination. Uh, you know, one of the we'll talk about the internet a little later on in the, in the session. But one of the ideas of the internet is it's fault tolerant. Fault tolerant means if there's a problem, it will stay up and running. And so, you know, God forbid a nuclear bomb hits Chicago, we can still talk to LA by routing through Dallas. So with these packets, there's this thing called a multiplexer. We know it as a short term, short word for that is a MUX, which on one end will take these packets, combine packets, and send them off, so it'll be done efficiently. On the other end, we'll take the packets and distribute them to the proper endpoint, whether it's a terminal or something else. And so a MUX is kind of a, a multiplexer. It just takes packets and separates them and combines them as need be. Who knows what a protocol is? Rules and guidelines. So when we were in the Cold War back in the day with Russia, I think we may be going back into it, but that's a different problem. When we were in the Cold, the serious Cold War back in the 50s and 60s, there was this fear of a nuclear holocaust where we believed Russia aimed nuclear missiles at us and maybe we believed they fired them. And then we would respond in kind and that would be the end of everyone. Um, but there were, even in the worst of times, there was a protocol set up between the President of the United States and whether it was Khrushchev or whoever was the leader of Russia at the time that said, before you fire back, let's do something. Let's make sure. So there's nothing stupid here. So it wasn't a law. It was a protocol or a set of rules that people would follow so they can communicate better. So you need protocols in all of these kind of da data communication scenarios so that one computer can communicate with another. Because they had different rules to communicate. It would be like they're talking different languages. So the protocol are, protocols are the set of rules that allow all of the different devices that are, communicate today, 
allows them to talk to each other. Protoc protocols define formatting, timing, sequencing, error checking, and things like that. So a couple of protocols they talk about in Cybertech, so I'll mention them here, ISDN and DSL, which are fairly irrelevant to us here in a fairly cosmopolitan world where everything is done through either wireless or um, you know, high speed cable. But these were protocols that were set up for running over telephone lines. And they're still used today in rural areas where there's just no cable, there's no high speed availability. So these are um, twisted pair based data communication capabilities where they essentially take the analog wave that you'd expect on twisted pair and digitize it. There are protocols in the wireless world because everyone needs to talk in the same language there. Um, and, you know, I, I don't even know what the most recent is. It could be WAP2 or WAP3. I don't know what the most recent one is, but the wireless application protocol defines how devices will talk to each other in a wireless world. RFID, radio frequency identification. You know, I, I, do any of you have a dog or a cat and you may have stuck a, um, a chip on them so they won't get lost? That chip uses RFID, so yeah, if they get lost, they can be identified and found. Finders, yes. So that uses an RFID, and it, it's constantly sending out a signal, so you can find them. Similarly, jet engines have RFID. Um, well, the engines themselves have it, but yes, the black boxes as well, so you can find those. Um, Just-in-time inventory management. You want to know where on the ocean that box of your cars are or whatever you, it is you're expecting to receive. So they have RFID chips associated with your, your crate so you know where they are in the process of coming to you. So RFID is used quite frequently. Near field communications. Near field communications. Anyone have an idea what this might be just by the name? It's Bluetooth. Bluetooth. So if two items are near, very close to each other, they use near they use near field communications. Um, it's used like if you go into a coffee shop and you want to pay and you kind of wave your phone and you pay. That's using near field communications. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Open systems interconnection is a model, not the only model, but a model of a protocol that is used in many situations. It is a seven layer protocol that allows a sender and a receiver to take some data from an application, get it ready to be sent, physically send it over whatever the transmission media is, and then for the receiving computer or device to take it and get it back to an application on the receiving side. So it starts with some kind of an application, an app on the sending side, and it ends with an app on the receiving side, and it goes through a series of layers. And I don't know, I'll talk about all seven layers here. But the layers start with just taking it from the application, taking it and putting it into some kind of a format, getting it into its packets, putting some controls on it so you know exactly what you sent, and then you, put, you add some, some check information uh, as well to the end of it. So as it gets through these layers, and the last layer is the physical layer where it's actually is transmitted, and as it's being decoded here, um, it checks to make sure that the data is all there because of the check information you put onto it and that you didn't lose some zeros and ones in transmission. And then it'll go all the way on to being on that, 
the, the, the receiving application. So this is just one of many different protocols that might be used. Okay. Networking. Local area networks. And then we'll, we'll talk first about local area networks. And then we'll talk about wide area networks. And wide area networks will come in three flavors. The internet, the intranet, and the extranet. We'll talk about all three. Local area networks. This room is a local area network. We're all connected to each other. We're all connected to that printer. It's a very closely held group of devices that are served in some way. How many of you have a local area network in your home? I do. And so you might have a local area network in your home to connect all of your devices at home. We'll talk about three topologies. A topology is, is kind of a way or an architecture that you might set up a local area network. We'll talk about a bus network, a ring network, and a star network. Now, in the real world, you'll have combinations of these. It's not as simple as, and, and differentiated as we're going to talk about them. But for now, um, for our purposes, I think talking about them separately is enough. A bus network. You may have heard the term Ethernet. Ethernet is a bus network. <coughs> Essentially, think of it as a backbone, a single cable. And every device is attached to that cable. Every device is constantly pulling and asking, do you have anything for me? you have anything for me? you have anything for me? you have anything? All day long. Do you have anything for me? Then as something passes through, let's say you wanted to print something, wherever the printer is, it passes through, they'll say, oh, you have anything for me? Oh, yeah, I got something. And then it'll print. And then it'll keep going here. And the thing about Ethernet is when it gets to the end, it's lost. So if you were trying to talk to somebody else in the, in the local area network and you didn't get them, it gets to the end and it's done because it's not a circle. It's a straight line. It doesn't bounce back. This goes to the very end. It's considered fault tolerant. The term fault tolerant, fault meaning if there's a problem, tolerant meaning it can accept it if there's a problem. So it's considered fault tolerant because if any device has a problem, that device isn't going to read its messages, obviously, but it doesn't affect at all any of the other devices from getting messages or sending messages it wants to, they want to send. So. It's considered the most fault tolerant of the devices, but it kind of takes up a lot of bandwidth. Think about it. Everyone's polling all the time. Everything's being passed all the way around. Um, but it's used quite a bit in the real world. That's a bus network. A ring network, shaped like a ring. also known as a token passing ring or a token ring. So let's just say this workstation wants to print something and it goes around counterclockwise. It has the information it wants to print. This bridge, which is really a way to get to the wide area network, says, is this for me? No. Is this for me? No. Is this for me? No. Is this for me? Yes. It'll print. And then it'll keep on going until somebody gets it. So it does it because it's a circle keep on going, which, as you can imagine, might have implications if there is a problem. It's considered partially fault tolerant. The pro problem with this is similar to the problem with Christmas tree lights. If one light goes out, they all go out. You know, they often have three different strands, so a third of them will go out. And so you have a problem. If there's a, if there's a problem on the network, you might have a problem there. 
um, what you would do to resolve that is you would have more than one ring. And so you have like a fault, you create fault tolerance by having multiple rings keeping everyone connected. In case one ring dies, you have a second ring. That's a ring network. The third network is a star network. And I know when I first set up my home network, we had a star network. One computer serves as the host, and then all the other computers, all the other devices attach through that computer. So if this workstation wants to print, it goes here. The host computer says, I got it. You want to go to the printer? And it'll send it to the printer. And so everything goes through that host computer. The problem with that is that host computer is down, you're down. It is the kind of the centerpiece of the entire star network. So it's considered the least fault tolerant of the three. And probably the least desirable approach to go by itself. It might be fine in conjunction with some of the others, but by itself the least desirable. Okay, so that's all local area networks. Now let's talk about the wide area network. And this is just a schematic to say wide area networks connect you all over the world. We think about wide area ne networks now, we think about the internet. But back in the day, when you were a company that was located all over the country, you wanted to connect your businesses to each other, you didn't want to, there was no internet to connect through. You would probably have something called a T1 line. I don't know how many of you, have any of you ever heard the term a T1 line? It's a big, wide cable, and you'd actually have the telephone company lay these lot wires for you to connect buildings to buildings or locations to locations physically so that you were not on a general um, network, because back in the day there really wasn't one. And even when there is one, you may still want to have a T1 line because you don't want to be there sending your traffic through the same networks as everyone else. In this case, we're showing it going through a satellite. Um, it can go any way that's appropriate. There are two ways to distribute applications. What you see, you know, the, the program you see on your screen when you wake up in the morning. One way is through a file server concept, and the other way is through what's called a client server architecture. File server. All of everything resides on some mainframe computer or some serving computer anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where it is. It all resides on that. Your terminal, your screen, which could be a very smart PC, is dumb in this case. All it does is display what is being served somewhere else. It's just a display vehicle, nothing more. In the client server architecture, one you see more of today, when you download an app on your phone, you're downloading a piece of software. Still a great deal of the architecture, of the application, resides on a server somewhere. But there's a piece of software that also resides locally. That's the client, S server client, client server. Okay, so a lot of apps are today using a client server architecture. The less you have on the client, you he might hear a term called, it's a thin client. A thin client has very little on the client and most of the, ser most of the applications on the server. We have thicker clients as well, which have more application on the client. So what, why do we do client-server? It's more responsive. Lower data communications cost. You have this PC here. You might as well, with lots of MIPS on it, lots of power to it. You might as well use some of that power. 
it's more flexible and more reliable. Let's say you're a global company with offices in the US and China and France, all using essentially the same application, but your workers at their desktop speak different languages, see things a different way. You'll want to put that display layer locally. So where you are shows the display that's appropriate for that worker. But the application itself is the same for everybody and is stored centrally. So the client tends to contain the presentation layer, what you see. So you might have two users. One is a, a power user and one is a, a new user. You might have different presentations for them. Now the servers, you would never want the data to be on the client, ever, because you don't want to lose control of your data. That's your core competency. I mean, you, don't, you lose control of your data, you lose control of your company. So more often than not, the data component, the databases, will be centrally stored. Now, other things like processing logic and things like that could be centrally stored, file server, or even in some cases on the client, depending upon what it is. But the data will always be central. The presentation layer more than likely will be local. And the three locations here together create an application. OK, the internet, the intranet, and the extranet. So the internet is what you know, everything about the internet. The intranet is the communications wide area network within a company. Intra means within. Inter means across. So the intranet is what you have within the company and you have controls and security to, to prevent others from getting into that. The extranet is the relationship between the company and the key um, people around that company, whether the suppliers, buyers, stockholders, whatever it might be, who need to have some information, but certainly not all the information within the company. So you, ha you might have specialized communications links with you know, important suppliers or important buyers. You know, if you're in a just-in-time world, you want to make sure that you have a very strong linkage to your supplier so that you can order something immediately and expect to get it right away. And that would be the extranet. And then the intranet is what everyone sees. So this is kind of a Venn diagram. Remember Venn diagrams of how you see everything? The, intran the intranet is a subset of the extranet, and the extranet is a subset of the overall internet. OK, the internet. Next few slides is just going to tell a story how the internet began. 1965. Where, what was happening between us and Russia in 1965? The, the Cold War, the arms race, not a lot of happy stuff. And it was the, the USSR at the time. Um, so the very first thing was MIT connected to computers in California using dial-up telephone lines. ARPA, which was developed by the Defense Department, was trying to figure out how they could create a wide area network that could withstand a nuclear attack. So how can you keep the, company, the country communicating in the case of a major problem? The ARPANET was the predecessor to the internet. In 1969, UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, Stanford, and the University of Utah were connected via leased telephone lines, so direct connections, if you would. They were part of kind of the military industrial complex at the time, building um, technologies for the military. 
And they were the first ones and then other universities at NASA and the RAND Corporation, which is, was a, um, a think tank for the military, also joined in. And they developed two very important uh, te technologies back then. Packet switching, which we've already talked about, and the concept of a router, something that will collect the data and send it out, kind of like a MUX almost. So that happened in 1969. In the 70s, BBN Technologies, which was a, a, a private company, they developed the at symbol, but they developed email back in the 70s. And they developed the communication protocol, which we all use today, called TCP IP, which what it is, it's a code that identifies a location, this computer has a, uh, an IP address. So if somebody wants to send something to this computer, it has an address. In the 1980s, the National Science Foundation began to develop a backbone of servers and gateways and networks. So this was still government run at this time, in the 1980s. Who remembers Al Gore? What did Al Gore say he, about the internet? What, what about what? Okay, back in the day, he was the vice president for Clinton, and he, when he was running for president, claimed he created the internet. Obviously, it preceded him, but there was something that very that happened in the Clinton administration, which really created the internet, which was it went from being a government-only thing, and it was privatized in the 1990s, and the privatization is what turned it from being this very small, nobody ever heard of it, to being what it is today. And it, it went through many iterations. I remember the beginning of the internet. You guys are all too young. I'm looking around. Yep, you're all too young. And it was pretty bad. Slow, and you know, it was just no, no pictures. You know. Yep, yep, yep. But in 1992, you know, a lot of um, private companies started to develop these um, POPs, these, these connectivities. There are a lot of small companies that grew into larger companies. And companies like WorldCom were getting into the game in the 1990s. And we'll talk about them later in the semester. They got out of the game in the 1990s because their CEO went to jail. Um, the first. Graphical user interface. Anyone know how to pronounce this? A GUI. There's a GUI. Graphical user interface. So and I, they started the process of turning it into what we know as the internet today. Just 20 years ago. 22 years ago. And in 1995, it, w it was given over to the world. And of course, two days ago, there was the big, or three days ago, the big thing about net neutrality. Yeah, the, the internet was originally meant to be some way for everyone to communicate fairly. It certainly moved very quickly into a, an enterprise for comp larger companies. And then, does anybody, anybody hear of net neutrality, at least the words? Anybody know what it is? Want to explain? Uh, so, pretty much they're regulating, well, the FCC wanted to regulate, or didn't want to regulate the internet so that they can And, and equal. Right. So the idea of net neutrality is that nobody can pay extra and get faster service on the internet than others. And so that's what passed um, recently. And companies like Verizon are none too pleased because that was going to be. Well, Verizon, you know, they are an important part of the internet's backbone. And they would like nothing more than to create a revenue stream for themselves by defining who. You know, if, if, if Netflix wanted to pay more so they had a faster pathway, they'd be happy to take their money and give them a faster pathway. 
So net neutrality prevents that, and they were not too pleased. So, so that was the internet. Some standards, the IP address, you, you might see a number like this, defines exactly where you are. Each of these numbers kind of hones you in a little bit to where you're located. The World Wide Web, www dot something, 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 is the multimedia portion. So all of the pictures and voice and movies and whatever else you're able to do on the internet come, is due to www. How many of you have written something in HTML? A few, almost everyone. So HTML is kind of a very rudimentary language that allows you to develop screen pages pretty quickly. HTTP, it is the communications protocol to transfer web pages. And um, HTTPS, how many of you have seen this? Secure. Never give personal information if it doesn't have that S. Right? I've, got, you know, I've gone to like restaurants that want you to put in a, um, you know, you can put an order online, and they're small restaurants, and you know, they want you to give your credit card information. Don't ever do it if it doesn't have the S. The S makes sure that the data that goes through is encrypted, so that nobody can just grab it. So when, when they're asking you for personal information, make sure there's an S, otherwise just not worth it. You know what encrypted means? They, they put it into a code that's hard to read. Some other things, um, the URL, that's the kind of the, the um, whatever you, you're going for. The donate, domain name like google.com. There are a variety of different suffixes now. More. Google just bought a suffix. I don't remember what, what, remember what it was. Yeah, they just, bought a, they just bought a suffix so they can have everything in that suffix. Didn't even pay that much. It was only like 25 million. I think you might be right. And the URLs take you to an IP address. This SSL. Secure socket laboring, la layering is that S over there that ensures encryption with HTTPS. Not going to go through this, but here's HTML code. Pretty basic. Anyone can learn it in an hour, honestly. Almost anyone. Not, not looking at anyone in particular. And that will look turn into a simple page like this. We don't need to do that. OK, which of the following enables users to view data with a browser? Which of these? All of the above. EDI, Electronic Data Interchange. So back in the day, two companies wanted to do a deal, buy something. A company wanted to buy something from another company. They'd put out a purchase order. It would be mailed. They would ship the goods. They would then mail the invoice. They would then print a check and mail the check. And then you'd be done in about three weeks, if you're lucky. EDI takes that. And all of those steps can happen immediately through just online. The key thing to make any EDI work is a protocol. Whatever language you're talking here when you're putting in an order has to be a language that this company understands when they're reading your transmission. And so there are protocols. When I was working at Goldman, I was intimately involved with something called the FIX protocol, F-I-X, which was the language that financial services companies use to talk to each other. If there's an order for to buy or sell a stock, what's that language? And so you need a protocol to ensure that the two sides are talking the same language. And once you have that, then everything is possible. 
So want to differentiate e-commerce from e-business? E-commerce is just the transactions, the actual transacting of business. E-business is bigger, so e-commerce is a subset of e-business. E-business includes service, um, trading of information, um, recording of internal processes. So e-business is bigger than e-commerce. You know, this is almost an irrelevant slide today. Every company is both an e-company and for the most part, they're becoming traditional as well. Even Amazon opening up stores, trying to figure out a way to get closer to the, to the business, to their, their customer, so they can deliver faster. Um, so you might have heard of brick and mortar. That's you know, the Best Buy store. E-tailers only don't have any brick and mortar. They you know, E-trade, but they do actually have brick and mortar now. They, they, you know, everyone's moving to be both. And then somebody like Walmart, which has both. So it's hard to, it's a continuum of how, how much you are on one side of it or the other, brick and mortar versus E. When you think about e-commerce from, from a business to business perspective, it shortens the time from purchase to delivery. For a buyer, it gives them access to more vendors. Since there'll be fewer errors, it reduces costs. And it provides data in a real-time basis. If once you put an order in, it's there. The other side has it. It tightens relationships to have business to business. In a just-in-time world, you, you need to be able to do this. And if you're good at this as a vendor, then the company that needs is, is doing just-in-time inventory management will do more business with you because you're going to be there when they need it. So it's an important part of the business-to-business -business world um, landscape today. XML. It's an EDI concept. It's called Extensible Markup Language. The basis of XML is it has a header, a tag, and then a value. So essentially, you can send different record types. You'll see it in XR, XB, BLR. You can send, everyone can have a unique record type that's defined by the tag value relationship. These tags could say, so you, everyone, let me go to the XBRL thing make more sense. So XBRL is what's used to automatically send financial statement information today to the SEC, to analysts at investment banks, etc. Think about how useful that is to do that through XBRL. By sending the financial statement rather than printing it, when you're, if you're an analyst at uh, Goldman Sachs, because I mentioned them before, you get it in automated fashion, you can take that XBRL file, parse it, and put it directly into a, an Excel file and do an analysis immediately rather than having to wait for the paper version and then retype everything. So the tag, each field is a tag. I, I just make sure I have one. Here, here you go. Okay. Down here, this looks like a little piece of a financial statement, right? Bottom. Current assets, whatever the numbers would be. You'd have a tag and a value. So this tag says, I'm sending you a field called cash equivalents. When, it, at, when it's current, as of, et cetera. And then you're saying the value is a million. I'm sending you a field called other assets, other current assets, and the value is 200,000. And then you're sending a total field, 1.2 million. So company A may not have the exact same fields as company B. By having this tag value concept, everybody could have a different format for their financial statements. They could send the financial statement that they want to send. It does not force every company to have the exact same format for their financial statements. They have their own <laughs> format, and they send it. And the receiver knows how to read this 
because it's a protocol, XBRL, and the receiver can then decode it and create exactly the right um, display document, so they can display it, or they can take these fields and put it into a spreadsheet. Some of the um, benefits, XBRL is standard, so it's a standard now, the SEC, and every company has the option of doing it. So using a tool like IDEA, you can search for the tags and decode them. It's automatic and reliable. And companies still can create their own specific format. They don't have to have the same format. It's not trying to, to um, formalize a single format for all financial statements. You can have your own format. It can be customized. Um, so that's not a problem. It's faster because it's automatic. And certainly investment banks or whoever wants to be able to kind of make decisions off of the financial statements want to get it as quickly as possible. Okay, it's chapter four.